Yeah, meeting the military in Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech at the two o'clock block here on a given Thursday. And today we're going to talk about the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum uh, with Chuck Merkel. And he's a retired Navy submariner, which is entirely appropriate, isn't it? Hi, Chuck. Thank you for joining the show. Well, thanks for this opportunity, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, they say the Navy is different from all the other services. And part of the reason is a, it's a space thing, you know. If I, if I know that, um, you know, uh, my life is between the port and the starboard, um, I have to get along with people. <clears throat> if I'm on a ship, I, I really have to get along with people. But that is accentuated in a submarine because port and starboard and submarine is so much closer. Do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, it's very tight quarters. Uh, there's no wasted space. And, and everybody on board has to do their job to, to, for the ship to, to accomplish its missions. So it, it, yeah, it's very important. It must be a very interesting experience. In fact, you know, back to the early part of the 20th century when submarines were first, um, you know, in play, it, I'm sure it's always been a very interesting experience because you're down there and you can't let the claustrophobia get you. You, you have to, um, I, I don't know if this is the case on modern submarines, but the switch bunks. If you go to the bowfin, which which you're the commander of the bowfin right now, aren't you? Right. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, Chuck has had uh, commands at sea and submarines uh, over a 35 year career, which is really something. And uh, submarines are such an important part of our, our naval our naval fleet. Uh, and what's happening at Pearl Harbor at the sub base there? That's an important part of our submarines as part of a part of our naval fleet. So. So um, you've had plenty of time in lots of places in the Navy. And I'm just wondering, um, you, you decided to retire here a few years ago. Uh, why here? Um, well, I, I grew up in a military family and, and we lived up and down the, the East Coast of the United States. Um, during that time frame, the longest I lived anywhere was five years growing up and it was down in Key West, Florida. And my blood got pretty thin down there, and, and it was by far my parents' favorite place that the family ever lived while we were in military. So when it came time to where was I going to be home port or where did I want to get assigned, I looked at the choices available. You know, Hawaii was at the top of the list and uh, was fortunate enough that, you know, that I was able to get my first sea tour out here and fell in love with the place, uh, met a local girl and got married. and. You know, we, we made it our goal to make this our home permanently. So you know, fortunately, we were able to make that work out. Yeah, it's great. It's great. I mean, I've, I've met a lot of military seniors, and um, I found that the, the, the military has a, a significant presence here in Hawaii uh, in the form of the senior officers who have chosen to retire here. And to me, that's a very important part of the community. And that's why I like doing this show. I like talking to guys like you, Chuck. Um, Thanks. Anyway, so the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum, you know, I, I had when I first saw that the name of that of that museum, I thought, oh, well, they must have a whole bunch of nuclear submarines out somewhere where I haven't seen them yet. <laughs> but it's not true. <laughs> what is in the Pacific Fleet Submarine Museum? Well, well, the centerpiece of our of our museum is the World War II Fleet Submarine, the Bofin. And then uh, our campus is about three acres. We've got a number of outdoor artifacts from uh, World War II and, and into the current era. And then in the museum now, we have three galleries. Uh, the first gallery is a World War II gallery, which obviously covers, covers that period of history where you know, most people probably don't realize our, our submarine force was only 2% of our Navy during World War II, but it accounted for almost 60% of the Japanese merchant ships that were sunk during the war. Uh, that success came at a, at a tremendous price though. We lost 52 ships and over 3,500 men. So that gallery talks about the history of the force during that time frame and pays a tribute to those submarine sailors. Um, our next gallery is Cold War gallery. So we talk about how uh, really, the two biggest developments during the Cold War that impacted submarines was nuclear propulsion and then the submarine launched ballistic missile and how those contributed to those two technologies contributed to keeping uh, 
the Cold War cold, as it were. And then our final gallery is our modern gallery where we look from the end of the Cold War in 1989, 1990 to present day and how our submarines have uh, con continued to contribute to the defense of our country. I think very interesting. And I hope you don't mind, I'd like to unpack each one of those galleries with you. Um, sure. I've seen the Bofin, I've been on the Bofin and I, it's, it's just remarkable how, how the Bofin is a sort of combination of materials. There's actual rope rope uh, on the bowfin, which plays a part in the way the submarine works. I forget exactly where the rope was, um, mm -hmm. but it's very small, intimate, if you will. Um, and, the, and, the, and the racks are very close to each other. And um, it would give you claustrophobia. On the other hand, it was a fighting ship. And right. it, it sunk its share of traffic in the, in the Pacific, I'm sure. Yes, it did. That was a, it was I think she was in number 17 or so in terms of ships sunk in tonnage sunk during World War II. So definitely the hop, upper end of ships in terms of, uh, of World War II. And, you know, in terms of personal space, there's really not that much difference. The ships have gotten a little bit bigger, a little more comfortable, but, you know, the sailors pretty much had to have the same amount of space today as on the modern ships as they did during World War II. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I think you learn a lot by visiting the Bofin. You, you make the comparison inevitably between what you've seen in the movies and the Bofin. You haven't seen too much Bofin in the movies. Uh, all the movies are about later versions of submarines. <clears throat> but you, you get to realize that even in World War II, the, the, the idea of a submarine was still somewhat experimental. Um, and we were developing you know, the, the dive mechanisms, uh, developing the storage mechanisms. Uh, the, the diesel generation mechanisms, all of that was under under development, and uh, you got to hand it to the people who, who 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 developed that and risked their lives in in that experiment and 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 performed their mission in that experiment. Yeah, it, it's it's very impressive. Our submarine force started in 1900, and you already kind of talked about some of the early days. Uh, some of our early submarines had gasoline engines. You even begin to imagine gasoline you in, imagine, in that yeah. enclosed environment. And uh, the World War II fleet submarine, which is what Bofin represents, that, that class of submarine was designed in the 30s. So we're coming up on, you know, 90 years ago that, that people or the engineers were putting pen to paper using their slide rules to, to calculate how these ships would operate. But, you know, we went into the war, um, you know, our policy leading up to World War II was that we did not exercise restricted, unrestricted warfare, which meant if we were going to sink a target ship of some kind, not a warship, a cargo ship that was carrying contraband, you would have to take some measures to take the crew off of that ship before you sank it. But you know, that was our official policy but I think, you know, when we started looking in the 30s at our war planning and everything, that that really wasn't going to work. There's not much room on a submarine for the crew you've got. How are you going to account for a crew? And if you surface to take the crew off, then you're vulnerable to attack. And an airplane certainly can't land and pick up a crew of a ship before it drops a bomb on it. So those, those rules of warfare for, were becoming outdated by our more modern machinery. Mm -hmm. So... Really, I think the, the way was already paved, but when, when Imperial Japan attacked here on December 7th, that opened the door and literally that day, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations issued the order to execute unrestricted warfare. And well, I, uh, I, my neighbor back, uh, this is uh, 30 years ago, my neighbor here in Hawaii, guy named Bill Kinsella. He was a four striper like you. Uh, oh man, actually, he was an admiral. He retired as an admiral. But during the war, he had command of one of these Ofen class or whatever other class there yeah. might have been. Uh, it was an attack submarine here in the Pacific, and they had some kind of record about how much shipping they sank. Right. Um, and he had stories for me. Gee whiz, I tell you, it was all out of a book or a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, the adventures they had, the, the, the challenges they had to meet. And, and they got back alive, they got back. And that was you know, quite a, an achievement in those days. Yeah, and, you know, early in the war, we, like rest of our armed forces, we really weren't ready on December 7th to go to war. 
Um, our training had been very simplistic and unrealistic. We really hadn't practiced, oh, we're going to go do this unrestricted warfare mission. And our torpedoes had not been adequately tested. And there were a number of defects in those torpedoes that there, there's little doubt that caused the loss of some of the submarines we lost in the war and probably prolonged the war because we didn't sink ships early on in the war. Yeah. It took about a year and a half to iron out those torpedo issues and, and to realize that to employ these ships properly, they really had to spend most of their time on the surface where they had a better, they could look out further on the horizon, use a radar, but it meant that they had to practice being able to submerge from being surfaced to submerge in less than a minute. Um, and when you think about, you know, Bofin was state-of-the-art for a day, but everything was, you know, manually operated. And so when that order for an emergent dive was given, every man in every compartment had to do their job in order and in the right sequence so that the ship could safely resubmerge. And even then, when they came up for air, what have you, or reconnaissance, um, communications were not all that good. It's not like they could be thousands of miles away from Pearl and, and pick up a phone and say hi. Right, right. They had to, they had to, you know, we were limited really to the long range communication was HF radio, which sent you in the AM band. And later in the war, they had a VHF, very high frequency for low, you know, short range tactical communications. But yeah, once they really, once they left Pearl Harbor until you know, they, they started on their way home and gave an arrival report from when they expected to get back to, you know, be at Midway or Pearl or Australia or later in the war, Guam and Saipan. Nobody really knew, you know, you didn't know yeah. until they, they got back. So really still, they were very independent. Yeah. Yes. I was going to mention that, you know, it goes back to, uh, I don't know, the 18th century in the British Navy when, when you got your, when you opened your orders after leaving port, commander, uh, you know, took off the wax seal and all that. Um, they give you a very broad mission, and, you know, and you had right. no choice to argue with it. On the other hand, um, they had no further input because you were at sea already. And right. as the commander of that vessel, you did what you felt was right. And you had so much power, you had total power over the over that submarine or that in that case, it was a sailing ship. But um, I wonder if, you know, if the submarine being distant, um, having communications issues, um, you know, it, it's a different kind of command. You were in command of submarines. Um, it's a different kind of command than a, than a, than a surface vessel um, because you don't have the same kind of connection. You're underwater a lot of the time you know, with, with the command back home. You know? Right. No, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, there's obviously more modern means of communication, so it's a little quicker these days. But still, you know, when you're down under, underwater, you're there's no direct path. So maybe several hours before you would get an order or be able to make a report. Much shorter today, and there's more expectations of communications today. But you can be alone and unafraid. Yeah, I was going to ask you about afraid. You know, it seems to me whether you run the Bofin or you run a modern attack submarine with every piece of technology that the, you know that the that the tech industry and the navy can devise you still are in a a dangerous situation and you don't know if it's going to save you am i right yeah, there's a little bit of that you know and i've always been asked you know how could you i'm not sure you know people have said i'm not sure i could serve or i'd be scared i never felt that um i always had great confidence in, you know, the, the ship was well built, well maintained, the operators were well trained, you had to have faith in all your operators. And, and, you know, as a captain, you're ultimately responsible for that training for your crew, to make sure that they're ready to do their job. So, um, you know, once you're once the lines are cast off, and you're underway, everything happens because somebody on board your ship is doing their job. Um, you, you can't take for granted that you'll turn the light switch on and your light will come on in your office or your stateroom, or that you'll be able to go to the bathroom and flush the toilet, or then take a shower or wash your hands or brush your teeth or any of those things. 
somebody's keeping the waste tanks empty and keeping the water tanks full and keeping the lights on and you know there's there's always activity in the galley there's four meals a day every six hours a meal so there's always something being cooked and you know all those things that are happening and, and so there's always and and you learn not to take any of it for granted because the minute that you do that's the thing that's going to bite you yeah well that must have been uh, accentuated in the time of uh, in in the second room if you will of the museum where you have the cold war where you have uh, the, the the game playing with the russians and the russian submarines where you had the entry of uh, nuclear under rickover uh, I can hear the sound of the sonar beeping as we speak. I can hear it. <laughs> and and, and uh, it was also very dramatic, very romantic, and very dangerous, especially when you have you know that a few feet away from you is a nuclear reactor. Uh, you've been that experience. I mean, how do you feel about Can you feel the little particles? <laughs> no, no. Can, no, no, you can't. <laughs> no, it's there. It, it it's well designed. The operators are well trained. Always felt completely safe with with the with the nuclear power plant. And you know, I, I think you know a lot of people that that Cold War era, folks don't realize that for 60 years, continuously we've had nuclear powered ballistic missile submarines on patrol in our oceans, ready to defend our interests. If you know, to to deter aggression against our country. Over 60 years, uh, and to this day, there is in, in the Atlantic and the Pacific, there are ballistic missile submarines out there. Their exact position, known only to those men on board those ships, men and women, now, and uh, they're there, hoping that that message never comes. Um, you know, and then on the other side, our our fast attack submarines were out there to put the our enemies' ballistic missile submarines at risk. So those those two two things. So you, so you have two kinds here. One is you have the ballistic missile submarines, which are dedicated to ballistic missiles, and you have the attack submarines that attack the other guys' ballistic missile submarines. Yeah. Right, and and to protect our aircraft carriers and and all those sort of things. Yes. Oh, that's yeah, very fast interesting. attack submarines. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you were in the Navy, uh, at least a part of that period, um, and you saw that technology develop. Uh, I always, always found it a great expression of American technology that we could make submarines that did all those things, that, that, and that we could do it in re relatively short time. I guess why, that's why Rickover was such a hero, because he could move mountains to have the Navy change its, mm -hmm. its science and its organization to make room for nuclear. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was a... Pretty amazing development, you know. Basically, late late forties is when his office was stood up, and you know, by fifty four, fifty five, we had our first nuclear powered submarine, you know, the Nautilus, underway. And you know, the the legacy is tremendous. Well, let's let's move to room three. I'm oh, sure. I, I have a personal interest in room three in the sense that I covered the uh, USS Greenville incident for PBS back in 2001. And uh, I think it was called the uh, something services building right outside Makalapa Gate, uh, fleet services building or some name like that. Fleet and family services maybe? Yeah, it's a building right outside the gate and it's where the press gathered and I was representing PBS for that. And um, <clears throat> uh, we, we, we covered the Court of Inquiry, Navy Court of Inquiry that looked into that. And in doing so, we could understand uh, what was going on on these submarines. They also give us a tour of one of the sister ships um, to the uh, Greenville, which is identical in many ways mm -hmm. to the Greenville. And we got to, we got to know all about it. Uh, what I found interesting was, um, you know, the, the technology. <clears throat> I found interesting, uh, the one thing that sticks in my mind, Chuck, was the Court of Inquiry met on that. And they used the term, um, it was, a, it was a, a central standard in their evaluation of what happened on the, on the uh, Greenville. They used the term uh, command climate, okay? which, yes. which they thought, and there were four or five admirals from various places in the world who came to be this court of inquiry. 
they thought that was really critical. And that sort of helps me understand what it's like to be the commander of a submarine, what it's like to be a crew member of a submarine, and what it's like to see them work together in the control room. That was some, I was in the Coast Guard. I, I, I never saw that so much as I did in the Greenville you know, uh, investigation. Um, can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, I, I've kind of already said a little bit that, you know, every every crew member on board has to has to do their job to the best of their ability to, to for the ship to succeed in, in whether it's just simply getting underway, going out, submerging for the day, surfacing and coming back into port. And and you've got to allow your men and women now to to be able to speak up when something isn't right. Um, you've got to train them to recognize those those indicators of whatever watch station they might be that there's something wrong. The ship's standing into danger, and they can't have any fear of being suppressed when that gets when they raise their hand, because you know the 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 first time that then happens that you that you shut a sailor down like that. That's not only you haven't just shut that sailor down; you shut down anybody that saw it, and then is subsequently going to hear about it. Because that goes through the whole crew. When you've got a 130, 140 people on board your ship, there's no secrets. Um, and so, you know, I I say, you know, you know, it when when 9/11 happened and when I was in command, we were we were on our way to Bahrain. Uh, we had left Singapore on the 6th of September, and we were on our way to Bahrain for a port visit, about a 10 day transit. And we were on Bahrain time, just you know, shift time zones and that sort of thing. When you're underwater, you can make the time of day anything you want. Nobody's really gonna know, right? So we were on our, you know, we were on the time zone for the port we were headed to. So it was really just after dinner when we came to, up to communications depth that night and immediately knew, you know, something serious. We didn't know what exactly had happened, but we knew something was very serious we were where our nation needed us to be, and it was time for us to go do our job. And you know, it had to depend on every crew member. So in a bat of an eye, a 10-day transit turned into a 10-week underway. So instead of 10 days, we were underway 70 days. If we didn't have our food loaded right, if we didn't have our repair parts, if we didn't have all the materials we needed to keep the ship running, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, and it's same again then in, in early, in late 2002, or I guess September 11th, 2002, I was back home at Pearl. We were in a maintenance period for the ship and I got called up to my boss's office and he said, uh, you need to be ready to deploy uh, the Monday after Thanksgiving. So uh, before I left his office, a group of people had sat down in there and we'd mapped out where we were and where we needed to be on 20, on the day after the Monday after Thanksgiving, and we had a new schedule. And I walked down, assembled the crew at quarters and, and told them what was happening. We were supposed to deploy in the spring of 03. Um, and uh, we now had our schedule. Now, ultimately, we didn't, we, we were ready. We were ready to go the, the Monday after Thanksgiving. It was, but it wasn't really until right at middle, middle of January then we, we left here. And we left Hawaii. And three weeks later, we were in the northern end of the Red Sea. And we transited 10,000 miles in three weeks. And ultimately, we didn't pull into port until just before Easter. We pulled into uh, Port Perth, Australia. We'd been underway 80 days, and we'd steamed 25,000 miles. We'd launched 25 tomahawks. Um, those sorts of things don't happen unless you let your people do their jobs. Yeah, and, and unless everybody is prepared to have things change, everybody is prepared to meet the mission no matter what, there's a certain dedication involved when you're underwater and you know you don't know exactly how long or what you're ultimately going to do. Uh, it's a very interesting experience, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah. I always felt the uh, submariners were the, were the cream because of that. And I also felt that if you're in that very small space like that, you, you get to understand relating to people. And uh, I guess that's part of being, certainly part of being in the crew, but 
also being in the captain, you have to understand the relationships in the crew. You have to make sure everybody is talking to each other and they're not walking around habut or anything. And and they are they're going to cooperate no matter what. It's, it's an interesting uh, social experience, social experiment. Yes. Yeah, so in the case of the uh, command climate issue in the Court of Inquiry for the Greenville, uh, a bunch of things happened and uh, or at least you know came to came to the attention of the public and uh, for that matter the newspapers and I, and I thought it was very interesting that uh, this was a test of the um, uh, what they call distinguished visitor program which was very yes. important at Pearl Harbor Admiral Fargo was uh, in charge of the the the, the larger command mm -hmm. um, and um, she was uh, the Navy was really discombobulated by this event because there had been loss of life because it was iconic it was Japanese citizens yep. and all and right off right off Waikiki and oh gee was all these iconic things were all in a confluence like that um, but it, was this known around the Navy did people talk about this did they learn about this did you know about the court of inquiry did you know what they were doing well, well certainly well, I was I was in command of the I had taken command of the of the Key West in November of 2000. So I I'd been in I had been in command about three months when when that happened. I was actually Key West was in port here in Pearl Harbor with it with it during a maintenance period. And I was actually in San Diego uh, meeting with uh, members of the of the carrier strike group staff that I was going to deploy with later in 2001. And uh, I was in my hotel room, I had come down with a bug of some kind and I was talking to my wife on the cell phone, looking forward to getting on the airplane in the morning and coming home. TV was on CNN and I saw the flash to, you know, they had a submarine on the surface and pretty, you know, pretty early on. So this was, you know, Friday evening for me in, in San Diego. And um, immediately then my, my, my XO tried to call me and, um, left a message saying that there'd been this collision and then my father called me uh he was in texas and retired senior chief in the navy he called me and wanted to check on me because all he had heard was that there would have been a submarine in a collision in hawaii and you know he he had ridden when i was exo he had ridden the the tunny our last underway was from San Diego up to Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton. And we did a, a tiger cruise where you take family members in multi, you know, it was three or four day overnight trip. Mm. Both him and my, him and his younger brother went. And we had, you know, the captains, a couple of his brothers and father, you know, they were, you know, and, and crew members had fathers or sons. So, you know, the very last surfacing we did with the Tunney was a, emergency surface, which is just what the Greenville had done yeah. when she had her. And uh, I was talking to my dad and, you know, he, his only underway on a Navy ship, even though he served 20 years, was that underway with me on the Tunney. So he, uh, he said, you know, I watched you guys when you were getting ready to do that. And in my mind, I didn't think that could have happened to you, but, you know, I just wanted to make sure. Um, so of course we all, you know, I don't, I knew Scott Waddle. I didn't know him well, but I never served with him directly, but knew, knew him and, and, you know, nobody would ever wish anything like that to happen to anybody. And it was just, uh, it, whole, was, it was a whole, yeah, a bunch of things that all unfortunate things that happened all at the same time. And as fate would have it, it resulted in the possible, the worst possible result. One thing, one thing that came up, and I wanted to just point this out with you, is that submarines have weapons. Um, submarines are um, tactical or larger nuclear um, equipment devices, and so there's a lot of security around submarines. I mean, even the 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 specs of a submarine about how far it can dive, how fast it can dive, how fast it can come up. All these, all these specifications, the submarines all classified. 
Um, that was one of the issues in this in the uh, Greenville case, and um, you know you you're you're always working within the this loose leaf book of highly classified top secret information because you're carrying weapons that are top secret. It it must add a certain amount of tension to know that you have the weapons and the classified information aboard. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a little bit of that I think I think you know the procedures are in place I mean I think everything is is safe and secure it's stable as long as you maintain maintain it within the specifications and that's not difficult to do um, certainly you know having I think probably the the thing that you know some of my other counterparts probably feel the same way was. You know, is when we started to, to really put rounds and weapons in chamber bullets. Um, those are the weapons I really worry about. Mm. Is that is there young men and now women that were having these weapons, and you know, you know that unfortunately has come to pass here. What a couple of years ago now, or a little over a year ago now, with uh, on the shipyard here. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, you know that. That one was a, is that those were the weapons I really worried about the, and you know, yeah, it has unfortunately that's come to happen a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, we live in transitional times. So let me ask you. So we've we've looked at each one of the three rooms, if you will. Um, what have we missed, Chuck? I mean, is there more uh, beyond this? Uh, what 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 comes to mind if you wanted to? tell a, a prospective visitor or a repeat visitor what to look for at the museum? Well, I think, uh, I think that uh, we've gone back and looked and there's certainly room for expansion in that modern gallery for the future, looking, looking forward. Um, there are things in there, a um, lot of interactive things. We've, we've designed a lot of exhibits for children and students to come in to engage them in science, technology, engineering, and math concepts so to stimulate those things. We've got a couple of innovation carts. Uh, we've got things like uh, we've got some we've at these carts. We also have like Lego and connect kits so kids can come in and build things and they can take a picture of it and they can text that or email it to, the, to their from here. So there's a lot of that. And then leaving the, the final thing as you leave the museum, there's a, a memorial wall. And that memorial wall is made up of the pictures of the more than 4,000 men who died while serving in our submarine force. That's on your website, isn't it? I've seen that. Yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, it was one of our staff members here at, at the Bowfin. It was his dedicated efforts has collected all these pictures. We're, I would expect we'll see some more now. Um, even even when we went to press on that, since then we've received some pictures. So I think you know there's some that are still there. There's also an interactive kiosk where you can do a search and you can pull up information about each one of those men. Um, and it's not very well known, but really the the first uh, submarine that the United States lost was lost off of Honolulu Harbor in 1915 with 21 men. Mm -hmm. So we have a memorial to that submarine here in the in the museum. And so that was a, that was a failure of the submarine in some way. Yes, it was in one of the early designs, and um, you know there there wasn't a sand island then. Pearl Harbor wasn't really fully open by that point, so our submarines were operating out of Honolulu Harbor, mm -hmm. and it was lost in 300 feet of water. Just so you know, you know how quickly the water gets deep out here. So it wasn't very far away when it brought some water in. I think probably what happened was the battery. You have seawater mixed with the battery chemistry, you get chlorine gas. And that probably is what overcame the crew. Even, even then, you had to be <laughs> familiar with all kinds of mechanical and physical issues and technologies. Right. Yep. And of course, <coughs> excuse me, of course, now you have to be familiar with uh, the nuclear aspect of it, which requires a lot of study, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and one thing that strikes me from what you said is that the United States Navy has been at Pearl Harbor since eight, 1850. That's when they first had a presence there. So 
the United States Navy is inextricably intertwined with these islands from way back in the time yes. of the monarchy. Yeah. So uh, I guess the last thing I'd like to ask you about is uh, the Navy itself. Uh, um, you know, the, the military has, um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been at issue, I suppose, in general during the Trump years. Um, certainly, uh, the National Guard was at issue in the Capitol insurrection a few weeks ago. Um, and I wonder what, I really wonder what young kids, including the kids come around to your museum, you know, think about the military now. And I wonder what they think about the Navy, uh, you know, as opposed to the other services. I always favored the Naval Services Chuck because because I am a person <laughs> who has been in a Naval <laughs> service. But I wonder what you would say to kids these days about a career in the Navy, a career in submarines. Well, I think it's it's incredibly it's challenging. It's but it's it's very very rewarding. Um, there's very few places that you can go to work for. Uh, at the age of 24, 25, where you can be the in charge of a of a multi-billion dollar warship and, and be the officer of the deck, giving the orders on where that ship goes and can drive in that submarine to accomplish a mission. Um, there, I don't think there's any other place that that offers that sort of thing to, to somebody young. Um, you know, and I would say, you know, I, I'm probably fairly typical. Um, when I joined the Navy, I didn't really think it would be a career. Um, I was out of money at the end of my sophomore year in college. And, and honestly, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to complete my degree in time. But the Navy offered me this opportunity. And, you know, the payback was three years. Um, and at the end of that three years, when I went to my shore duty at the first assignment, I was pretty well sure I was not going to stay in the Navy. I was going to do that shore duty tour and get out. But uh, the captain there in Idaho um, was a very good man. And uh, he took a personal interest in me and two other guys. And a few years ago, he confided in me and he said, my, my biggest goal while I was there as a the captain there in Idaho was to keep me and those other two guys in the Navy. And all three of us uh, stayed in, went on to command submarines and, and do those things. So he, you know, he really, he laid it out on the table. He showed me his letter of resignation. He showed me his job acceptance offer at a, at a commercial nuclear uh, company. And, you know, and I had all this, we were ready to go. I had a young family just like you, but you know, at the end of it, it just didn't feel right. And I, I like the closeness, the sense of accomplishment, the challenge. It's kind of it all wrapped. It's all wrapped up into into that ball. And you know, after sitting and talking with him quite a bit, and you know, then talking over with my wife, uh, we decided that I'd stay in. And here we are. It's funny how you remember those events, those meetings, those individuals who helped you make those decisions for the rest of your life, because they're turning points in your life. Right. And although we don't have time for my turning point, it was not dissimilar. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate your, your sharing, Chuck. Sure. Chuck, Chuck Merkel, uh, he's the executive director of the Pacific Fleet Submarine uh, Museum at Pearl Harbor. And uh, we all like to have his job and his career. Thank you so much, Chuck. Thank you very much, Jay.